So my name is Garrett Reisman. I grew up in Parsippany, New Jersey. I um, always was fascinated with space, and uh, but I never thought uh, my mom would ever let me become an astronaut because back then, all the astronauts were test pilots, and uh, my mom was scared of flying. So I figured that becoming a test pilot was not in the cards. I went off and I got my engineering degree, and I saw that... Um, and I was at University of Pennsylvania, and I saw that what some of the astronauts that they had selected had done for their education and also for um, their hobbies, like flying, scuba diving, those kinds of things, were similar to what I was doing with my life. And so I kind of had a, a eureka moment where a light bulb went off and I said, hey, maybe this could actually happen. I went off to graduate school. I came out here to California to Caltech in Pasadena and uh, studied multi-phase fluid mechanics. So... That's a fancy way of saying bubbles. If you have any questions about bubbles, I could probably still help you out. Um, I got my PhD in, in, uh, over there at Caltech, and when the time was right, I applied to the program. Uh, actually, time wasn't quite right. I think I was in a gray area about being even minimally qualified, but I applied anyway. And I uh, didn't get selected that first time, but I was encouraged because they actually didn't throw my application back at me and laugh at me, so that was nice. And then uh, a couple years later, I, I was working here again in Southern California at a company called TRW in Redondo Beach, an aerospace company. I was designing a satellite for NASA, and uh, it was time to, to have another selection, so I applied again. And by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, when you apply to become an astronaut, you start out by filling out the standard form for federal government employment. I think it's the SF-171A form. Don't ask me why I remember that, but... Um, it's a standard form. It's the same thing you fill out if you want to become like a postal worker. It's just in block nine, instead of writing postal worker, you write astronaut and you send that in. Um, so that's how it starts. And I went through that whole process. And um, obviously at NASA, failure is an option because they messed up and they took me instead of the other 19 incredibly well-qualified people that they had to choose from in my group. Um, I still to this day don't know why they made that error, but I'm very grateful that they did, and I was selected. Back in uh, 1998, I came uh, down to Houston, started training, and I didn't fly until 2008 when I had my first mission on right here on, on Endeavour, and um, that was a mission STS-123. And on that mission, I went up to the space station, and I stayed up there for uh, 95 days until Space Shuttle Discovery uh, commanded by Mark Kelly, uh, came up and brought me home. Some years later, I got a chance to fly again, this time in Atlantis, and that was STS-132. And I went up uh, back to the space station again, um, did a couple more spacewalks, and uh, had an incredible crew that uh, made it uh, just an, an amazing uh, life experience. And uh, came back, uh, and pretty soon after that, I left NASA. So I remember sitting uh, in this seat, and with a mirror, I could look back through these windows. And, and when you hold the mirror up here, when you look back, you can actually see the water deluge. So there's a giant water tower at the, at the pad. And right before the engine's light, the, the, all that, tons and tons, I don't know, a lot of water. It's some, I'm sure the, the other guys probably know how many gallons, but a lot of water comes flying out of that thing like Niagara Falls down into the flame trench. It's all to dampen out the, the acoustic energy, the noise that the engines make. If you flood it with water, it, it tends to dampen out and it won't damage the pad as, as much. So um, so it, you, you can see that happen right before the engine's light by holding up a mirror like here and looking out through that windows down the pad because you'd be... I'd be lying on my back right now, right? And um, you can see that, and then the engine's light. Then when the main engine's light, the whole stack rocks forward, okay, like this way, uh, because the engines are back there, and they're they're not quite lined up perfectly, so um, uh, the main engine's anyway with, with the CG, so, so the whole thing pitches forward. There's a moment, and then it comes back like a diving board. And right when it comes over the center, that's when the solid rocket's light. And as soon as that happens, it's like that. You get this kick in the, in the pants, and, and now you're going somewhere. Right? You can, it, we have shut down the main engines after we've lit them. You, you can throttle them. You can shut them down. There are three buttons right there that do that. But the solids are like firecrackers. Once they're lit, uh, there's no shutting them down, right? 
so you're going somewhere in a hurry. That force that you're feeling is the force of the thrust of these massive engines that are accelerating you. And your brain is doing this integration where you're, you're, <laughs> you're realizing that, uh, you know, the whole F equals MA thing, and, and you realize that all that G is translating into speed. And after about a couple minutes of that, being smart rocket scientists like we are, we think, oh, man, I'm going really fast. <laughs> now, like, a couple more minutes go by, and you're like, ah, I'm going super fast. And then another minute goes by, you're like, okay, this is ridiculous. I'm going ludicrous speed. <laughs> get me out of here. Uh, but the solids are lit. You're not going. You can't get out of anything, and you're going. And uh, sure enough, you go from zero miles an hour to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes in this thing. And so there's no other acceleration quite like that. And that's what's really unique about it. And then you get up to the top. And when you get up to the top and you're looking on the screens and you see the the main engine cutoff bug come alive and you know it's about to shut down when it hits the 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 center mark the engine shut down and instantaneously you go from three g's to zero and i remember on endeavor i was actually downstairs but i remember sitting in my seat and when that happened it it felt like i was going to get catapulted out of the out of my chair and i put my arms up like this because i was afraid of being a a bug on the on the like on the windshield kind of thing like getting squashed against the the bulkhead down there and then the two uh veteran astronauts that were sitting next to me started pointing at me and laughing <laughs> they're like look at the new guy with the arms up because i felt really silly i wasn't being shot out of my seat i just was no longer being held down into it and everything was floating around in space and i was like yeah i knew that was gonna happen yeah i knew it was a key um era in our spacefaring uh attempts i think you know, and someday I really hope that we look back at all this and think it's incredibly primitive, kind of like the way we tour sailing ships today and, and look at how, you know, uh, uh, how, um, uh, how they lived on the HMS Victory, for example, uh, how incredibly uh, primitive that seems by today's standards. And uh, I'm sure that will happen. I mean, our technology keeps getting better. But boy, you know, what it did, what this vehicle did in its day, uh, is, is, is still amazes me. Um, when you consider that she was designed in the 70s, um, and she can launch like a rocket, land like an airplane, you can do a spacewalk out of that airlock, you have a robot arm on here, you have this payload bay that you can take the Hubble Space Telescope up to space in your trunk. Um, we are far from creating a vehicle that can that has the capabilities um, that this thing has, even today, even with our advanced technologies. Now, we're advancing in a lot of other ways. I think our new vehicles are going to be safer. They're going to be more sustainable uh, from an economic standpoint, and they're going to be easier to fly. They're not going to have all these switches, um, that's for sure. But um, so we are we are definitely advancing, and, and uh, there's... there's but uh, this thing will be looked at upon, no question, as, as it already is, as a incredible technical marvel for its time. It's the absolute pinnacle of human in the loop when it comes to operating a vehicle. When you look at all these switches and you think about all the things we were trained to do because the computers that ran this vehicle were, by today's standards, incredibly primitive, um, we will never ask that of another crew again. And ever since we started making boats and uh, airplanes and cars, um, the level of, of, of human, the demand that we place on the operator, uh, on the pilot, has gone up and up and up and up until we reach this peak. It's all downhill from here. We'll never have humans this involved in flying their machines. In the future, we're going to have in the near future, we're going to have cars that drive themselves. Uh, our, our vehicles that we're working on now, if we're going back to space, demand a lot less of their crews. It'll never be like this again. And, and, and that's, in a way, it's the right thing to do from a te te technology standpoint. But it's also, to me, kind of bittersweet in the sense that this is a, a human capability endeavor um, that will never be performed to this level ever again. It is kind of weird. I mean, you sign up to do this thing, and, and then uh, you get up to the space station, and all your friends that you've been training with for a year shut the hatch and go away, and, and they come back in here, and they leave you on the other side of, of the hatch. <laughs> and you are there, and you know you're in there for kind of a long haul. Um, 
And so there was a moment there. I remember when I closed the hatch on the space station side and I looked around at Peggy and Yuri and I'm like, wow, these are the only two people I'm going to see for a while. That that was a strange feeling, but that passed almost immediately. And uh, it really wasn't, I wasn't concerned about that. I, about, um, it is strange that, you know, you know that you're doing this for the first time and, it's, and, and there's no quick way back. So, so, but, but, you know, so many other people had done that before. If I was the first one to make that commitment, it might have been strange. But um, I saw lots of other people do it, and uh, I was like, wow, you know, if uh, if Mike L.A. could do it, you know, I can do it. 